Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. I have no hobbies. And, uh, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> this is it. In addition to writing this book, which took extensive research, she is dean, a, a dean at Yale's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So anyway, that is terrific. Uh, after following her talk, she, we're going to have books for sale at the back of the room. And so bring them out the checkbook. Um, on, De on December 7th, we will have uh, Vanessa Gazzari speak on her book, The Penny But without further ado, let's give Allegra a big hand. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, Susan. And uh, it's wonderful to be in Stonington and to see quite a number of people with copies of a familiar book, which is kind of a good sign. How is my sound? It's OK? OK, good. A little more, a little more. OK, well, yell at me if I, if I don't speak loudly enough. So I want to start by talking at the starting point of this journey for me, which starts up here with this particular document. So how many people here know who Joshua Hempstead was? OK, well, I mean, uh, interestingly, some people don't. And he's a pretty a, a local guy. So Joshua Hempstead, this is his diary. And Joshua Hempstead was a New Londoner. He lived in New London from the time of his birth until his death um, from 1678 to 1758. And his house still survives. It's a historic house museum. I recommend it, um, although it's too cold now. So they're only <laughs> they have no heat. Um, but we'll we'll see some images of his house as well. So as I talk tonight, um, so this journey started for me uh, more than a decade ago when I discovered for me Joshua's diary. And here it is in manuscript form. Now, this is really an extraordinary diary. Um, it covers 47 years of his life. Um, believe it or not, it was published more than 100 years ago, um, which surprised me because as a colonial historian, I had not actually heard of the Hempstead Diary. Um, so I thought, what is this you know, long published diary that is so voluminous, so important? How do I not know about it? So it takes up more than 700 pages of the printed volume. Um, and you can see, so this is actually just one third of the diary. Um, the, there are three sections. It's owned by the New London County Historical Society. And you can see how he, you can already tell a little bit about Joshua from that diary, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't waste paper. He had quite a lovely hand. So Joshua was an ordinary guy. He was a farmer and a shipwright. He had no college education. Um, his, his only formal education, if you even want to call it that, was a shipwright's apprenticeship, which he had as a boy, like from the age of 10 to 18. 
And then he spent the rest of his life being kind of, um, you know, our image of the quint quintessential New England patriarch. You know, he was a little bit of a jack of all trades. He carved gravestones. He was a justice of the peace. He became a county court judge. He also did carpentry and repaired windows. And he was also a shipwright for most of his earlier life. But he became more and more involved in civic service as his life went on and would have been considered a fine, upstanding man in his town. So were it not for the diary, Joshua would really be, you know, quite a successful but ordinary, you know, New England patriarch. But there were two things about Joshua that were actually quite extraordinary. First, this diary. And to give you an idea, um, we do have some major colonial diaries. If you think of, for instance, Samuel Sewell, the famous magistrate from Boston, one of the Salem judges, he left a great diary. Um, there's the Parkman diary. But the, the, the great colonial diaries tend to be from either clerics or magistrates, and certainly people of, of, a, of a higher class than Joshua would have been. So to have a, a diary that is this consistent, this long, this significant is incredibly unusual. I don't know of another one. So that kind of begs the question. So it's been published, readily available, for more than 100 years. And I was surprised when I first encountered it um, no uh, professional historian had, wor had taken the diary on, so to speak, um, as a whole. So the diary's been a source for a lot of, you know, for genealogy, for local history, for various anecdotes. You know, he talks about the Boston earthquake, he talks about the Great Awakening, you know, some of these events. But taking on the diary as a whole really hadn't happened. So I was very excited when I encountered the diary. And I come from a background of studying family history, the history of family and domestic life and interior lives and the you know, emotional lives of people in the past. And I hoped that this diary would be a window into one man's life. So if you think of women's history in the past generation of expanding our views of women in the public sphere, um, uh, history now is moving also towards, you know, professional historians, towards looking at men's lives with a similar lens and looking at the interior lives of men. So less the public life and more the interior life. So I thought this diary would be a great opportunity to, to explore that. Now I spent, this is an image from Joshua's house. This is from his hall. And this is, you know, it, it, it's a little bit imagined, you know, because we don't know exactly where he wrote the diary or how he wrote it. But given the inventory contents of his house, this is kind of a likely scenario. There would have been some place he had it locked up in his house and he would have gone to it almost every day, um, sometimes catching up a couple days late. And um, this is in the main room of his house. So I told you there were two things, not just the diary, but there was one other thing about Joshua which made him particularly interesting for me. Um, so Joshua, here he was, this fine patriarch. He also, he got married when he was actually quite young, 18, which was young at the time. We think they got married really young, but they actually got married later. Um, but Joshua got married young, and he had nine children. But very sadly, um, after the birth of his ninth child, he was 38 years old, his wife was 40, and within a week of that child's birth, his wife died, and leaving a one-week-old baby, leaving Joshua with nine children from the ages of one week to 17 years. So, I mean, that would be a fairly insurmountable thing today. And at the time, because there was a gender division of labor and women took care of small children, it was a disaster. And Joshua faced, you know, a dilemma that many men in this position, many fathers faced, which was, you know, what do I do with my children? What do I do with my family? And the decision he made was really unusual. He never remarried. And he lived to be 80 years old. You know, he had to fill up this big diary for us. And um, he, um, so he lived to be 80 years old and he became, you know, what we would call a single parent for the remainder of his life for more than 40 years. And this, 
I mean, it almost never happened in colonial America. Men who became widowers tended to remarry, usually within a year, often within months. You know, three months, five months, six months, that would have been normal. Because there was no way to take care of these kids. Um, and I, I talk about, I won't go into all of it now, but you know, Joshua pursues various ways to kind of keep the family together and hold the family together. But you can imagine for me, as a historian of the family, I was really intrigued by a man who chose to be a single parent and who wrote more about parenting than other men might have because he didn't have a wife. So he's doing hands-on nursing of the kids, you know, when they're sick, at their bedside, and, and you know, he's writing about his daughters more than uh, other men would because they wouldn't be quite as involved in, the lives, in their lives. So you can imagine, you know, I thought this is really a gold mine. So I spent actually about a year just on the diary alone. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, entering this world, you know, there are lots of people, places, I mean, places that you all are probably quite familiar with, but that were very foreign to me, you know, the, the locality. And lots of, you know, family members, neighbors, a lot of them with the same names, which is really frustrating, you know, <laughs> you know, 10 lines of Joshua and, you know, everybody named John or whatever. So a lot of that was kind of figuring that out. But during that process, and I, I came to know him, I came to really admire him in many ways, and I think the most admirable thing about him was his devotion to his kids. He was an incredible father. So he didn't just choose to raise these kids on his own, he really poured his heart and soul, um, and he gave them his time, his effort, and in the end, he also gave them money. He was quite successful, and he saved, he was very frugal, see, no wasting paper. Um, and he, he ended up having a pretty large estate, and he set his children up pretty well. In fact, uh, the, there are people here who are living on this site where, and not the home, right? Uh, it's a different home. No, it's, it's still the same home. Okay, of one of the one of the children here. So it, it has lasted. So um, so that was kind of Joshua's story. But in going through all of these different people and places, um, one name really stood out for me, and one person and one story that was mysterious. And this was the name of Adam Jackson. And Adam was, when I first encountered the diary, I had no idea that Joshua was a slave owner. I thought he was just, you know, the kind of typical New England guy. I certainly knew about New England slavery, but I didn't, you know, it wasn't a particular interest. I, it didn't really occur to me that this was a story about slavery. And it was really the diary and people's everyday lives that convinced me otherwise, that slavery was an integral part of the New England story and of New England family life. So this name, this person, Adam Jackson, um, was Joshua's slave for more than 30 years. So 47 year diary, 30 years of it, more than 30 years are covering um, Adam's life as well. So, and I, here I was wanting to write this book about a family, about a household uh, and family dynamics, and I realized, how can I write about this Hempstead family when there's this other person, this other family existing right in the house, right in the room with him? So, so I, <laughs> that's cute. Um, so I, it really changed my view of family life and it made me want to learn who is this Adam Jackson. And I also, being a colonial, colonial historian, so here's an image, this is Joshua's, he would have called it his chamber, we would call it his bedroom. So this is the upstairs room. We were downstairs first, this is the upstairs room. And he did in fact have a trundle bed and he often had you know, some of his many children sleeping in the trundle bed. There's even a funny story, one of the funnier stories from the book that happened right here when one of his sons was sleeping in that bed or a similar, similarly positioned bed. When in the middle of the night they were all awakened with chaos because a rat had come in and bitten the son in the foot, in the bed. Gives you an idea of the hygiene, 
you know, and the, and, you know, the circumstances. So, you know, the house looks very lovely and the museum is lovely, but the reality was a little bit grittier. So, so here I had found this Adam Jackson, I was intrigued, but I also was aware that it was probably unlikely that I would be able to tell really a full story of Adam Jackson. I mean, he was illiter illiterate, he was enslaved, he never owned any property, he was property. So, you know, you can't find him in land records, you can't find him, the usual places don't exist. No gravestone, no nothing. So I first went to the diary, which was my, so my main source for everything, and I pulled out everything I could find about Adam, and I, I assembled it. And it came out to 50 pages. 50 pages about Adam Jackson, and I realized, oh my goodness, this might be the best documented enslaved American of this early period. I mean, what other enslaved person has 50 pages written about their individual life? So, now the diary, I should say, one reason why it, has, it hadn't been worked with, it hadn't attracted a lot of uh, interest from historians, it's a farmer's diary. So there's a lot of weather, there's a lot of weather. <laughs> there's a lot of, he was a shipwright. There's a lot of ships coming and going. So he tells you when so-and-so's ship came in, and so-and-so's ship came out. <laughs> and then the other big thing that's in there is work. So it, it, more than anything, it's a document about his working life. So entries, typical entries are kind of, I planted corn, I chopped wood, you know, uh, jo my son, you know, or my grandson, Josh and I chopped wood. On and on and on, 700 pages. So there is, uh, there is only really, I, I'm thinking of maybe one time where there's uh, a strong emotion. There's almost no emotion. When his wife dies, so the 38 year old wife, leaving him with nine children, it's like two lines. My dear wife died today. In fact, I think the page that I showed you was, was from that page. So um, within a week of his wife dying, his 17-year-old son dropped dead also. That also is just a line. So Joshua suffered his share of tragedies. His life was not easy, but it was a good life. And so here I found these 50 pages about Adam, who's also living in the house, who has his own story, even though I don't really know what his story is. First of all, why does he have a last name? And it's an English last name, interesting. Um, now, so I had the 50 pages, which was great, and told me a lot about Adam's working life. But I also knew, you know, this document was, you know, problematic. I mean, the diary in and of itself is kind of problematic because it's mostly weather and farming. but. It was particularly far, par, problematic as a, as a way to understand Adam's life because it's written by his owner. So, you know, there's a, you know, an intrinsic agenda there that is not about discovering who Adam is. So, um, where, where you, you can't find Joshua's emotional life, you really can't find Adam's emotional life in there. But what you can find is what he did. And that's a lot. And, and you can also see change over time, which is very unusual in historical documents of this period. So, meaning you can see what he did at 27, what he did at 35, what he did at 50. It's very unusual to be able to see that, uh, the, you know, over the life course. So, for instance, what does that tell me? Um, I saw that over the 30 years. At the beginning, when Adam first arrived, um, there are a lot of entries where it says, I planted corn, or I, you know, hoed the field, Adam helped. By the end of the 30 years, it's Adam planted corn, Adam chopped wood, I helped. By that time, Joshua is an elderly man, and he's not, you know, pulling his physical weight in the way that he was. So that also shows you Adam is taking on a more of a supervisory role. You see him supervising other workers. You see him acting independently, et cetera, et cetera. So that was really great, but it was still very limited. It was a very flat picture of who Adam is. And I mean, 
you know, ultimately the picture that we get of Adam it remains somewhat flat because it's from it's so indirect. Still, I, I went and I you know mustered all the other sources that I could. I read a hundred years of court records. I read town records, land records, probate records, everything. And what I found was I could tell not just Adam's story, but the story of his parents, his mother and father, his siblings, and I could even go back to his grandmother. And that really was another epiphany for me because I realized here I'm trying to write about family life in early New England, and these two families, really, they're both founding families. These families were here at the beginning, and I need to tell the story of these families together and how, you know, as one story, not as sort of compartmentalized stories, which is the way we have tended to do this kind of history up until now. So, and the result, I hope, in the book is, is really more of a seamless narrative of all of these families together, the Hempsteads, the Jacksons, and um, other related families. So let me tell you a little bit about Adam. Let me give you another image. What I found about, so this is the Hempstead house today, um, you know, probably familiar to many of you. So Adam, there's a reason why he had that English name. So Adam Jackson, it turns out, was a third generation New Englander. Wow, Joshua Hempstead was a third generation New Englander too. So they were, here these two men are you know, similarly positioned in terms of their, their place, you know, historically. And um, so he's a native born New, New Londoner. English is his first language. This is the only world he's ever known. Um, he grew up on another, in another part of New London. And let me tell you about the origins of his family. So his grandmother, we know very little about her, but we know enough to, to place her and place him in this history. Her name was Maria, and she was an enslaved teenager who came here from the West Indies in probably the 1650s or 1660s. And she came here, we know, you know very little about her personally, but the one thing is very poignant. She's described in all of the records as being Maria, deaf and dumb. So Maria came here not just an enslaved young woman, not speaking the language, not knowing the climate, not knowing anything about this foreign place. Um, she also couldn't really communicate with people. Um, so unimaginable what she must have gone through. But she prevailed, she survived, and she um, was purchased by one of the wealthiest families in town, a, a family that is familiar to some of you here. I had some conversations beforehand. So the Rogers family. How many people have heard of the Rogers? Okay, some Rogers. Rogerines, anyone? <laughs> Little bit, okay. <laughs> All right, so the Rogers family were another quite extraordinary family and they were they were not just one of the richest families, they were actually the second richest family in the colony of Connecticut um, behind the Winthrops, you know, who basically owned Connecticut. <laughs> so, um, so they were pretty wealthy. And James Rogers, the, the, the founder of the family, was a commercial baker, amazing, in the 1650s. And he operated a commercial baking, he made hardtack for ships. Um, and he oper operated a commercial bakery in New London, right near the Winthrops, and he founded, you know, a very, very wealthy established family, the Rogers. Now, one of the sons of James Rogers was a man named John Rogers, and he is always described as being somewhat intellectual, and um, he worked for his father, so he was a merchant as well, but he was very smart, he was well-read, and he traveled a lot for his father. I'm getting to the connection here, don't worry. Um, and he traveled a lot for his father. One of the places that he went to was Newport, Rhode Island. Now, you know, now, I mean, Rhode Island, Connecticut are good neighbors now, but at the time, Connecticut was Orthodox Puritan, Orthodox Congregationalist, you know, uh, where the, the civil power and the religious power were united. 
and you know by law you had to attend church, you had to contribute to the minister's salary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You couldn't deviate from that. Rhode Island was in the, the famous words of Cotton Mather, I mean he used more colorful language actually, but he called Rhode Island a cesspool um, because, because of the religious pluralism. So there were Catholics, Jews, Baptists, you know, ugh. So, <laughs> yeah, it was terrible, right? And um, so it was in this environment, coming from a very orthodox New London, where there was only Puritan congregationalism, that John Rogers would visit, and he became very engaged in the Baptist church there, which was really kind of a brand new concept brought over from England. And he converted. And John Rogers didn't, he didn't do anything halfway in his life. He was a zealot of the, of the first order. And he converted, then they weren't good enough for him, and then he founded his own sect. And he called them the Rogerines, <laughs> so, which is really uh, humorous. And um, he, and he brought basically his whole family, his whole neighborhood um, in Waterford and, and the other, uh, in that area. Um, he brought all of them, it was kind of a family, family business, family religion, um, and if you lived in that area and if you, were, if you worked for John Rogers, his servants, everyone converted to, to the Rogerine sect. Now, problem. Um, if you're of it, not a Congregationalist and you're going against the established church, you're going to have problems in Connecticut. So John Rogers, this is in the 1670s. Um, John Rogers, by founding this, this deviant sect, put himself in conflict with Connecticut religious and civil authorities for the rest of his life and he did so with, with gusto. And so he spent the rest of his life, and because he was an independently wealthy man, he could spend a lot of time going in and out of jail, for instance, uh, <laughs> staging protests. And the Rogerines were accused of a lot of things, and I think they probably did a, a fair number of them. Um, so they were accused of burning down the New London Meeting House. Not so sure, I mean, they might have done that. They were accused, oh, here in Stonington, they were accused of, and pardon my language, daubing feces on the Stonington Meeting House. That's from the court records. Um, and they probably did that. And they, um, what else did they do? Oh, and they would stage protests. In the, the minister at that time in New London was Gordon Saltonstall, some of you may know, and he was kind of a, he was very pompous, and he wore a big long wig. And he was young, he was in his 20s, and, and he, he, was, he was quite pompous. And everyone describes him this way, very pretentious, very smart and very capable, but, but he put people the wrong way. And he would be in the middle of his sermon, John Rogers would break, oh, and John Rogers was, they were Sabbatarians, so they didn't believe in the Sunday Sabbath. They believed the Sat Saturday was the Sabbath. So part of their duty was to disrupt the Sabbath on Sunday. And so John Rogers would come in, you know, the, of the meeting house, rolling a, a wheelbarrow of shoes that he had made himself and screaming at the top of his lungs, selling the shoes, you know, mayhem would ensue, he'd be arrested, thrown into the jail, then he'd break out of jail, then he'd go into the stocks, and you know, this went on for years. So, and why did he do the shoes? Um, he did the shoes because he believed you weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath. And he believed manual labor was good for the spirit, and this was sort of a display of labor, you know, a protest, essentially. So, um, John Rogers. So why did I bring all the, the Rogers family? Um, it was the Rogers family who owned Maria, Adam Jackson's grandmother. So it was in this environment that Maria had a daughter by the name of Joan, Joan Jackson. And Joan became Adam's mother. So Joan grew up in the Rogers family. She was probably a Rogerine. And um, in, let me bring in Adam's father now. In, 1660, in 1686, 
Adam's father arrived, much like his grandmother had done as an enslaved teenager. He was 18 years old, and he was purchased from the West Indies. And he arrived in New London and um, had to make his way. And he was purchased by none other than John Rogers. <laughs> so so you, the Jackson's family's fate becomes intertwined with that of the Rogers, both for good and for bad. They, you know, they lived in an environment of a lot of protest and defiance and, and courage, frankly. And it was in this environment that, his, that Adam's parents met and married, and they actually lived as a young married couple on John Rogers' farm. Mama Coke, is that how it's pronounced? Okay. See, I'm a foreigner, so I don't know. Um, so they lived there on John Rogers' farm. They had their own house there. But problem. They, they married. When they first got married, John Rogers actually had freed Adam's father, John. This was around 1698, really early. People didn't free slaves in those days. John Rogers did. And um, he married Joan. Joan was still enslaved with another side of the Rogers family, a Rogers sister. So when they were first married, they had to live apart, maybe about four miles away. But the relations were very close with the family. And they had two children within the first two or three years of their marriage. First Adam, our Adam, and then a little girl named Miriam. After that, Joan was given her freedom by the family who owned her. Problem? Joan, and then Joan, Joan joined her husband at Mamacoke. Now, by law, your status, your legal status, comes from your mother. So if your mother is a slave when you are born, you're a slave for life even if she becomes free thereafter. Um, if your mother's free when you're born, you're free for life. So Adam and Miriam, their mother had to leave them behind. So this gets us to the story of how did Adam grow up? He, he was only two years old when his parents had to leave him. He never lived with his mother again. That said, he had his sister and he grew up as an enslaved boy in a, what was then the North Parish, which I think is now Montville. And he learned farming. And he maintained close contact with his parents. Um, one of the few, th the only words of his that survive, and they're not from Joshua, they're from a court case, are paraphrased words where, where Adam says, it, it, the, the, what the witness says is, Adam Jackson is often heard to say, Joan and John Jackson are my parents. So this boy who had to be left at the age of two, when he was 27, 30, 35, very much identified with this original biological family and a family with whom in this small town he was still able to maintain close ties with. And his parents went on to have a very long marriage. They had seven more children. So a, a big colonial family, a lot like the Hempsteads, right? So let me just, let me get you to the connection now. So Adam Jackson, he grew up not very far from Joshua. Joshua probably knew Adam from the time of Adam's birth. So he, um, Adam's master died when Adam was 27 years old. And Joshua actually came in and in a slick little maneuver, he was doing the estate inventory and he made an offer for Adam. So he, he purchased Adam at the age of 27. And Adam, you know, there's very little in the diary. First he says, I bought Adam, okay? And he says how much he paid. A few days later, Adam is come this morn. That's it. And the day that, that Adam came, he was 27 years old. And just to give you an idea of what this slavery was like in New England. So you saw the house. Um, the house as it currently stands was half the size. I mean, in the past it was half. There's a one half addition onto it. So it was half the size of what it is today. It was really just the first room, the lower room, the chamber with the bed, and then there was one more room, which was, you know, it was the attic, 
called the garret. So, I mean, we wouldn't really qualify it as a room, but essentially a three-room house. When Adam arrived in 1727, there were already 10 people living in the house. Hmm. And that included Joshua. Remember, he didn't have a wife, but he had his children. One of his, his sons was married and had two little children of their own, so he had a whole other family in the house. And, um, oh, his elderly mother, Joshua's elderly mother, who was in her 80s and was sickly, was, um, was also living in the house. So when we picture slavery in New England, their, their circumstances were completely normal. Um, it's, in, it's very intimate. So you can hear everything, you can see everything, um, and these people are sharing, sharing work, sharing space, sharing food, sharing everything. So, and, and you know, historians have argued whether that was good or bad for the, the enslaved person, and I think you could probably imagine that it was probably both. You know, if you're living in the family, hopefully you get similar treatment to people in the family. You know, they're not making separate meals, and you know, you're kind of more at a, the same plane, just because of physical constraints. But, um, living with your master and his family in close intimacy. I mean, imagine living with your boss, not that it's the same, but you know, uh, you know, one would imagine that would be extremely difficult and a different kind of oppression. There was also isolation for people because someone like Adam, he's the only enslaved person in the house, so there's no one else for him, you know, to, to that said, there are people all over town who are similarly situated. So he did have his social world. So just as I'm winding up, I wanted to show you. So um, Adam, I told you the family was separated already when, when Adam was two years old. And in the book I talk about, the Jacksons actually fa faced many struggles um, of being separated and being um, straddling slavery and freedom. And Adam's father, John Jackson, emerges really as a great American hero, I think. Um, an extraordinary man who came here enslaved, not speaking English, got his freedom, got his own last name, and then ended up fighting for his family. Um, the Rogers, uh, I t you know, were interesting characters and they had this religion, et cetera, et cetera. They also fought a lot. So they're constantly in court fighting with each other. So very dysfunctional family. I don't really know what was going on. Apologies. Um, so um, they, uh, they, one of the things they litigated over was the Jackson family themselves. And it's great for a historian because it gives us records that we can see what's happening with them. But what happened to Adam's parents was that they lived for 10 years very peaceably and you know, prosperously. They're described as prosperous. And then there's a lawsuit that comes and they're ripped apart. And the wife and some of the children are taken into slavery again. And John Jackson, the father, then has to choose how he's going to react to this. He had no money. He had no standing. He was a freedman. He was nothing in this society. <coughs> And what did he do? He fought for his family for, uh, it took him seven years to get his wife back. Um, and he fought in court. He broke into a house and stole his wife and children away. And then he, he fought for years in court. He litigated in Connecticut. He litigated in Massachusetts. And I'll give you a little hint. He ended up being largely successful. That's the amazing thing. So John Jackson, this is just one little moment in his legal struggles. Um, again, illiterate, and we have nothing, no phys physical, tangi tangible connection to the Jackson family. This was as close as I ever got, this document. And you'll see here, the, the, this is John Rogers Jr. actually, the son of the, the, the religious founder. Then Samuel Fox above it, and then the name above it, it says, the mark of John Jackson, and you see there's this funny little squiggly circle in the middle. That's John Jackson's signature. Now most people, when they couldn't sign, would make an X. That's the typical thing, unless you were a Native American, actually, and they had some pretty interesting signs. 
John Jackson, always the individual, always standing apart, makes this little kind of circle thing. And that's the only piece that we have of him that's survived. So I just wanted to show you that. And then this last image is, this is actually the garret, the attic in the Hempstead house. And um, this is probably where Adam spent the 30 years, um, you know, where he slept. And it didn't look like this, though. Um, it would have been more boarding house style. So the garret was the place where all the young men in the house would sleep. So that would include sons, uh, friends, neighbors, uh, people working in the house, enslaved people. And it would have been probably, I think it was like college dorm type of you know, thing, frat house, I don't know. Um, and also, the, the garret would have been, it was a storage area, so it would have been filled with stuff. Um, you know, corn cobs and you know, all kinds of, and it probably was kind of nasty, actually. Um, and you remember the rat? I mean, there are reasons why the rat were, was there. So, but it's here that in here we kind of have like the intersection between these two families where Adam Jackson slept and, but it was the Hempstead house. So, thought I'd open for any questions or conversation. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, it, uh, so how did the Jackson name come to be? You know, I tried so hard to find where he got that name. John Jackson, the father, appears with that name around 1699. I have no idea where it came from. It was not a name that was in New London. There was a Jackson family in New London County, but farther away, and there's no connection, and I don't know. But it's so like John Jackson to do something that's complete, that breaks the mold, yeah. So that's another question. Um, did, was Adam permitted to marry? Did he marry? So we don't know for a fact if he was permitted to marry, but every indication would lead us to believe that if he had wanted to marry, he could have married. Um, so Joshua was a justice of the peace, and he married many enslaved people in that house in front of Adam. And it was very common for enslaved people to marry um, in New London. Um, you did have to have permission of your master, but there were a lot of reasons why a master would want you to marry, particularly to avoid any kind of sexual you know, shenanigans. So people, they wanted people to be married and you know. So, so it's very interesting that Adam didn't marry. It's very, it's unusual. And here you have Joshua, who didn't marry either. So, and one of the things, I speculate in the book as to why Adam might have done that, if, if he had the opportunity to marry, and there were people to marry. Um, and I wonder, he suffered so much trauma in his childhood, and he saw so much oh, tragedy in his parents' lives. I wondered if he wanted to live a very, kind of simple, you know, follow the rules kind of life and not get involved. But I don't know. I do think that if he had a girlfriend or a child or a, you know, wife, we would know. Because it, it would have come up, even in the lawsuits about the Jackson family, whenever people have more kids, the kids get mentioned in the lawsuit too. They try to take everybody. So if Adam had children, they probably would have been mentioned, and I think Joshua would have mentioned them. So. You mentioned two slaves um, arriving in New London. Yes. Um, slaves don't just arrive. I mean, they, they, are, they, they are shipped. Uh, somebody owns them on the way. Yes. Did they ship a captain and purchase them and then resell them? Yes. So this is how would Maria and uh, John Jackson, for instance, as, and their, their examples are very typical in the 17th century. Um, so the West Indian trade from the very beginning of New London was our major trading partner. So, and those were relatively small ships that went back and forth, local men who were the masters of the ships. 
And the way, so there, the slave trading at this early period was not on a grand scale and it was not directly from Africa um, in, in New London. Um, in this early period, if, if a local person wanted to, I mean this is horrible, so pardon me, um, they would actually order a slave. So you would go to a ship captain, you would say, what they would literally say is, I want a likely Negro boy of 16 years. So you'd pick sort of the age, the gender, you know, maybe what they did, but probably not, um, you know, physical health, and you'd pick a ship owner whom you knew and trusted, who was a neighbor, and then that person would, would make the choice for you. So there was that. Um, and then the other way was ship captains would go, would go down there and they would, would, would essentially buy people on consignment, bring them back up here, and then sell them once they were here. And John Jackson, the father, we know that he was purchased on consignment. He was purchased by the ship captain, a man named Jonathan Parker. And Parker owned him for two or three years and then he, then he through a business deal, was, was bought by John Rogers. So, but their, their experience is typical of this early period in the slave trade in New England. So, uh, and people would come over one, two, or three people, enslaved people on one ship. So not big numbers in this early, early period. What were those slaves like, like in the West Indies? Were they already enslaved, being, uh, working on the sugar? Yes, so slavery in this period in the West Indies was horrible. Um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of disease, people being literally worked to death. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that it might have been a better working arrangement, you know, for someone. But it's also true that um, the, I mean, historians of slavery have, have said that, that it tended to be the, the oh, this is horrible, sort of weaker slaves, defective, tended to go to the New England market. Oh, like Maria, yeah, like Maria. Yeah, and some of them were strong to stand up in the field. And because the New England market was not as competitive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so. But they did a lot, they went up to Newport and bought slaves, didn't they? Yes, um, but it was still relatively small scale, you know, in the mid 17th century, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, that all changed in the 18th century, of course, but in this early period, so. Yeah. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry. Well, I just want to say, first of all, I love the book. Thank you. And um, I was so impressed by the research, which I think was taking years. How many years? Well, uh, more than 10. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's just say. <laughs> I also felt there must have been moments of just joy when you found something and then long periods of time when you couldn't get to the emotions. Yes. I um, yes. I mean, I think you, you uh, to do this kind of work, you have to be, a, you know, a fanatic. And I love archival, obviously, I love archival work. For me, it's exciting and, you know, even the tedium. You know, I, I didn't pick the Hemsa diary for nothing. The fact that it was this boring farmer's diary, I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, because, because I knew there had to be just incredible secrets locked in there. You just had to, you know, you just had to work with it and kind of live it and try to get into the head. So I love that. I love this period. I love these people. So, uh, you know, it, for me, it was fun. Long, but fun. <laughs> what happened to Adam after Joshua died? So, hi. Oh, after this one, okay, sorry. Um, what happened to Adam after Joshua died? So Joshua died first, you know, he was kind of uh, of the age of his father, uh, you know, it was sort of father-son age difference. And Joshua died first, and 
for me, the problem was when Joshua died, the diary died. So, I, oh my God, what am I going to do? How am I going to find Adam? What happened to Adam? Nobody wrote about Adam. And he didn't write in his will or not, there was no evidence of what happened to Adam. Um, but then through going through lots and lots of records in, in Hartford, I found Adam on the tax rolls. So he was free. So, but I, uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes? Ah, okay. Um, I was able to track him and he probably died in, so uh, Joshua died in 1758 at the age of 80, and Adam died probably in 1764, not that long, you know, but five, six years after, um, and he would have been in his 60s. So, but still, you know, a decent age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would be really careful about saying that, that any enslaved person was part of the family. Now, it is true that they had a different concept of family. And when they described their family, that would include their servants and their slaves. So in that sense, yes. But in our sense, no. But I was wondering if that was the case, that I thought he was there so long, that he was there so long, No. So we don't actually know. We don't know. Um, but my guess is that, that there was some arrangement made. Or, you know, his sons, uh, Hempstead's sons, after their father's death, you know, they had control over the estate. There was one son who was the executor. So it might have been his decision. That's possible. But I would imagine it was something that they discussed because, you know, they did discuss but he didn't write it down. But that it was never written down. And he was very proud. And he wrote things down. Yeah, so it's it's a little questionable. The other thing is freedom from our perspective is a you know unqualified good. And you know, in an intrinsic sense it is, but freedom when you're old, poor, um, and have no way of earning a living could be a very bleak thing. So there were laws on the books in this period that if you freed a slave who was elderly, a long-serving slave who was elderly, that you had to, um, you had to, you know, the town could force you to pay for that person's care. So people tried to get out of their commitments by freeing people. Um, yeah. So that's pretty bleak. Yeah. Do you know when slavery was abolished in Connecticut? Um, I think the last, uh, it's 1840s, yeah, 1848, yeah. yeah. So it, the process started in the revolution, but it was a gradual, uh, the American Revolution, but it was a gradual process. There was a gradual emancipation act in 1784, but you know, so Adam's dying in 1764, so it's long before he would have even seen any of that. But it started to become less socially acceptable during the revolutionary period. Yeah. Um, from the records, that you said he was on the tax rolls. Yeah. Uh, did that suggest that he paid a lot of tax? No, 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 no. He was in the section with the poor, essentially the poor. Um, I think the minimum was 18 pounds. So it meant he had a minimum estate, you know, negligible. But he was in among with uh, English people who were poor. So he's just a, a poor man, someone who would have had to hire himself out to live. Yeah. I forgot whether you did any research at the NEHGS, the New England Historic, who did. I didn't actually go there, but I, I used their online stuff. Yes? The former director was Ralph Crandall. He'd been born in Mystic, he had a PhD, and he was a descendant of the Rogers. Uh-huh. And uh, 
Been very oh, to be able to that would have been great. I did give a talk there, so they invited me there. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, but I don't think he was there. No. <laughs> yeah. You said a lot of it dealt with weather. What did you learn about the weather? That, you know, so actually, that's kind of interesting. Um, the weather. So I learned a couple of things about the weather. First of all, this was in the period that is called the Little Ice Age. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It was colder then. So they, I mean, not only did they, you know, have very inefficient fireplaces, but I mean, it was freezing. So you really see that in the diary, how cold it is and how difficult it is. Um, yeah? <laughs> so the other thing I learned about weather was how why he would write about weather. So obvi the obvious thing the f as a farmer. But more than that, um, you can see him sometimes, you know, as he gets farther along, you can see how he uses the diary. So he'll say, you know, this is the first time in 30 years that it hailed or blah, blah, whatever. And then it dawned on me one time, oh yeah, he knows. Because he can go, you know, and he sometimes he'll have these kind of benchmarks, weather benchmarks, where he's clearly looking and remembering and, you know, using the diary as a reference point. So he did use the diary as a reference. And he used it in accounting and, you know, all kind, keeping track of things, keeping track of things in his life. And weather was one of them. So. What, what do you know so since he died? Yeah. Okay. Um, there, it, there's some murkiness. Um, it, was, it was clearly in the hands of his son, uh, John, an executor. And then there's oral history that says it was divided into separate sections. It is in separate sections, so that seems to correlate. And it, supposedly it was given to different branches of the family for safekeeping. And there's also a story that some daughter-in-law at some point uh, threw it in the fire, one section. There clearly is a missing section. Uh, the earliest section isn't there. Because it starts in the middle, which is a shame. So, um, but we still have 47 years, so that's pretty good. Um, and then, it, and apparently it was a well-known document. So local history people, before it was published, knew to, to go to it, which is so amazing. So people would go to the house and look at the diary. They knew, it, people knew that it existed. And then um, New London County Historical Society, you know, that was the beginning of that whole movement of, of re, um, they're a very early society, I think they're 1870s, which is early for a local historical society. And there was a movement, you know, all across New England to recapture and, you know, uh, New England history. And so they pretty quickly wanted to get a hold of this diary. And it took a while before the, the two sections were given to it by the family. And then there was one section that was with one family and that section disappeared in the early 20th century. An unscrupulous lawyer, actually. And it resurfaced in 2011. I kid you not. No, um, the, the picture that I showed you, that's one section. Um, Joshua made the diary himself. He bought the paper, he sewed it, he put it together. So it's just a handmade thing. It's not you know, bound in any formal way. Um, so that third section was missing for, I don't know, 50, 70 years, more, mm -hmm. almost 100 years. And then it came up at auction in 2011. And thankfully, the New London His County Historical Society was able to buy it. I'm oh, OK. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. 
him were doing it. And it was one of the bitter. And it was, you know, they called it Elvis. Really yeah. And fortunately, um, the other guy stopped. But it was really a lot more than they did. Come to find out day later, the auction called him. Um, listen, the guy doing it yesterday was going to buy it for 50. Oh. But he didn't tell us. Oh. Oh. So the auctioneer dumped the price back. Which is amazing. Yeah. Oh, to have an honest auctioneer yeah. is great. Yeah. Yeah, it would be horrible. Yeah. Yeah. There's a big vault. Yeah. Yes. Mullen County published a version of it a long time ago, and they republished it around 98. Yeah. The missing section in the public version, or was that? Um, thankfully, the missing section was not missing in the 19th century when it was tra originally transcribed. So even though it was physically missing, the transcription still existed. So we still had that. So, but now the society is able to compare that section with the new version and make. So it's the Victorians. Yeah. who were editing, <laughs> not the colonials. Yeah. So, well, thank you all so very much. <laughs>